Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, another nice day for the most part uh, in the state, so that's great. And this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about alfalfa and some forage pests um, in South Dakota. We're going to start off talking about insect pests, and then we'll move into some disease issues with alfalfa and round it off with some basic soil fertility information on alfalfa and forages in South Dakota. Uh, this morning, we're going to start off with Pat Wagner and uh, Pat has his bachelor's from Iowa State and a master's in entomology from UNL Lincoln. And he's based out of Rapid City. He primarily focuses on West River, South Dakota, um, different entomology issues across the state, though I know he's covered lots of things. Um, he also works collaboratively with people on campus and other organizations um, to provide timely based research information to all of you across the state of South Dakota. So thanks, Pat, for joining us today. He is going to talk about um, insect pests of alfalfa. And without uh, any more stalling here, I will let him take it away. His slides will cooperate. All right, thanks, Sarah. So I had my... Not quite. Up here, but now they're not showing up. That's usually what happens. <laughs> there we go. How about now? I'll wait for it to go to slideshow here. Yep, looks good. Thanks, Pat. Perfect. All right, well, Sarah, thanks for that introduction. And thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, again, my name is Patrick Wagner and I'm based um, West River um, in the Rapid City Regional Office. Um, I've included uh, Dr. Adam Varenhorst as a, a kind of a co-presenter on this, but um, he just contributed a lot of information on these slides. Um, and he would be the, he's the state specialist. So he'd be um, based out in Brookings. So all of those of you that are um, east of the river, uh, he'd be your key contact person out there. So um, we've got a lot of information to cover, but I'll try to kind of power through it. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the insect pests that we can see in alfalfa. And um, Adam and I kind of made a, a short list, um, at least tried to condense it to some degree, uh, to just kind of the common ones that you might see. Um, and basically how this will work, we'll just kind of go through each insect pest and we'll I'll share some information about, you know, what they look like, kind of what the, the damage might be, um, you know, for scouting uh, and that kind of thing. And then we'll talk about some of the management options um, that are there for, you know, prevention and then control if any outbreaks do pop up. So we'll just jump right into it here. The first one here is the um, alfalfa weevil. I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with that. Uh, we, you can see it here, the adult beetle, um, this light brown with the dark brown stripe on the back. And then they have this long snout on the front. Um, that's pretty characteristic of all, all weevils for that matter. And then the larva here, these small gray worm, or excuse me, small green uh, worms. So with alfalfa weevil, they're going to affect the first cutting and basically any regrowth. So um, there'll be a, a problem right away and just kind of continue to, to persist. Um, the larva, they're going to be feeding on the basically the growing points and the, you know, the new leaves. And the damage is just going to look like kind of some circular holes there on the, on the leaves. And you can see that in this picture here, some um, pretty severe defoliation there from um, caused by these weevils. So you're going to want to scout, like I said, they show up right away in the spring. So start out in May um, with that spring green up. Um, the threshold here is about two larva per stem, or if you have 30 to 40 percent of the leaf tips being damaged. Uh, so when it comes to management here, the alfalfa weevil, uh, one option is doing um, early harvest. Uh, the big thing here is uh, foliar insecticides. Um, usually we'll recommend doing like a uh, a tank mix of um, like a pyrethroid. And then uh, if you still have Lors band, I know you can't get that anymore, but um, if you have like a generic Lors band, that works great. Um, so that way you kind of get a, a immediate knockdown and then a pretty good residual. Um, so they don't just come back and reinfest the field right away. 
But um, keep in mind that alfalfa is a flowering crop, so you will have pollinators out there. So if you can, um, if you're gonna apply an insecticide, do it in the late afternoon or in the evening. Um, that's when those pollinators are gonna be less active. So um, that's gonna have a, a lesser impact there on those, those beneficial insects. And the other thing that I wanted to throw in here was grazing livestock um, in the fall. And the idea here is that um, those weevils are gonna be overwintering at the base of the plants. So if you have livestock in there, you have some trampling action that can kind of crush uh, some of those weevils um, and those disturb those uh, uh, overwintering sites. It's even better actually if you could graze sheep out there because sheep will actually um, have been found to kind of search through and, and will actually pick out the weevils. So. Um, if that's an option for you, definitely uh, give that a shot. It's by no means a silver bullet, but it might reduce your weevil populations in the following year. So the next one here is the potato leaf hopper. So this is what they look like here, this little green insect there, kind of pale green, and they are a little bit bullet shaped, I guess. So that's a migratory insect. They come up from the southern United States each year, and uh, because they migrate up, that kind of limits the damage to um, the later cuttings. First cutting, I mean, usually that's out before these things even show up. So this is what the injury looks like. We refer to this as hopper burn. They're gonna be feeding on the plant xylem and it kind of looks like um, damage stress or excuse me, drought stress, the damage does right away. Um, but it's, it's, like I said, it's that we call that hopper burn and it'll reduce the quality of the plant um, it can kind of cause stunting and just reduce the protein content. So management for leaf hoppers, uh, the scouting kind of depends on the size and um, the height of the plants and you know what stage they're in and that kind of thing and then the number of, of leaf hoppers. I'm not going to go into details there, but I think if you search potato leaf hopper on our extension website, you should be able to find kind of a table that, that outlines those, um, those different thresholds. For management, you know, we want to, the goal here is to reduce the buildup of these leaf hoppers. So you want to harvest, you can harvest in the bud stage that can kind of reduce the populations. Um, another thing, obviously there's insecticides that are labeled for these as well. So that's, that's an option if they reach threshold levels. There's several different aphids that can impact alfalfa. Uh, these are just kind of a list of the, the common ones here. Uh, probably the biggest one, though, is the P aphids, and that's what I'm going to focus on uh, just briefly here. So these are actually pretty large aphids or up to a quarter inch long. I mean, that's large in terms of, of aphid sizes anyway. Um, these things will take off. Uh, the populations will really take off during periods of cool weather. So um, what was it? Not last year, but the year before we had kind of that really cool wet year. Um, it seemed like it was uh, pretty cool and wet through the summer. We did have some issues with these popping up, um, but if a field's infested, it'll kind of can give off a, a bit of a golden hue, um, if you will, and those large populations can impact your yields. Now with P aphids and then with all the other aphids really in general, uh, most of them, you know, the alfalfa can tolerate low populations and they'll really be kept in check by some of those natural enemies, the predators and, and parasitoid insects. Um, but if you do have a problem with them, um, early harvest is, is one management option there. And then there's also insecticides labeled for these. Uh, this table just kind of outlines what that kind of looks like for thresholds, um, depending on growth stage there. So if the, the plants are less than 10 inches tall, um, you can use a sweep net there and it's the threshold is 300 aphids per 30 sweeps, or you can do stem counts. Um, and so per 30 stems, that'd be 40 aphids there. So it just kind of gives an example. Moving on um, to the plant bugs here. So these are the three different plant bugs that you'll um, often see in an, in an alfalfa field, the meadow plant bug, the ligus bug, and then the alfalfa plant bug. Now the meadow plant bug is something that you don't really need to worry about. Um, if you do see these, they'll be in the field edges 
or if it's like a, a grass hay alfalfa mix, that's where these things will show up because they feed on the grasses. They're not gonna really even um, affect the alfalfa in any way. So not really something to worry about. It's these other two um, that we need to watch for. So those were the uh, pictures of the adults. Here are what the nymphs look like. The top picture is those um, alfalfa plant bugs and then the bottom is a, a ligus bug. And with these insects, they're gonna feed on, again, uh, much like a lot of these others, they'll feed on the growing points um, and it can cause stunting and reduced forage quality. And with these, you wanna start scouting again in May. Really, I'd, I'd say June is the bigger time because that's when these populations really start to ramp up. Uh, so with plant bug management, uh, you'll wanna harvest hopefully before the adults are present. So um, try to try to take care of those nymphs early on. If you can um, do an early harvest, that'll kind of eliminate those nymphs and cause a lot of mortality among them. You're just eliminating that food source basically. Uh, the threshold here for, we use a sweep net, as you can see there, running through there. Um, with ligus bugs, it's 40 bugs per 10 sweeps. And then alfalfa bugs, it's 30 per 10 sweeps. And that includes both nymphs and adults um, considered in those thresholds. All right, moving on. Talking about grasshoppers, you're all familiar with these. Uh, both the nymphs and the adults will feed on the leaves here. Um, there's, there's just a couple of uh, uh, common ones that you might see. The top picture, there's a differential grasshopper, and then the bottom is a two-striped. We also have the red-legged grasshopper that's pretty common um, here in South Dakota. Uh, so as you know, large populations can cause pretty significant defoliation. They can just skeletonize the plants. And this is more of an issue during uh, dry periods. Once, I mean, normally they're gonna be out in the grasslands, out in a range setting, but once, you know, maybe you get later in the season or if it's a drought period um, and the grass starts to dry down, they're gonna be looking for anything green and that's gonna be our crop fields and, you know, big lush green alfalfa field, especially, you know, if it's irrigated and everything, um, that's what they're gonna go for. So in terms of management with these, here's kind of the, the threshold levels for grasshoppers. Um, it's eight to 10 adults per square yard or 15 to 20 nymphs. Um, the, the adults threshold is lower because those adults are gonna be eating a lot more um, than the nymphs can. But this diagram here kind of shows what, um, you know, just an example of what maybe a, a scouting pattern might look like. So each of those squares kind of represents a, a a square yard and you can do visual counts or you can do um, a few uh, pendulum sweep net sweeps through there and that will kind of give you the same results. Um, but keep those, those uh, spots about 50 feet apart from the fence line and kind of move in in like a U or a V shape like that. And that way you kind of will be able to gauge if there's an edge effect going on um, or how far into the field that that they're a problem. So you might not need to, if you have to spray an insecticide, you might not have to spray the entire field, just hit the edges um, if that's where they're moving in at. And then um, just some other options with that. If, you know, one thing is if you harvest and then you can leave strips behind, that'll serve as like a refuge. And then all those grasshoppers will congregate into those strips. And then you can treat that and that'll um, kind of at least save you some money so you don't have to spray as much, you just hit those strips and uh, get a really good knockdown with these. The other thing is you wanna avoid pre-harvest intervals. Uh, I mean, that's true with any of these pests. So if it's close enough to harvest, you might be better off just waiting until after harvest and treating the stubble. Um, so that way you're not um, having that pre-harvest interval with some of those insecticides. So next I'm gonna talk about uh, three different cutworms. And um, honestly, the, the, the um, kind of damage and then the management with these and scouting is, is very similar, um, but we'll just talk about each one and what they look like here. So the first one is the army cutworm. And you can see in this picture, they're kind of a dark brown color. They'll have these three light brown stripes down the back and then they'll have a light brown head. And 
Um, they're common in more in June and July. They'll feed on the leaves and these ones can um, eat the, the entire plant. For management here, um, you're not gonna see these during the daytime. They're nocturnal. So in order to scout for these, we need, need to uh, dig uh, square foot holes and then you kind of sift through that dirt and see what the, um, just kind of count the number of, of cutworms that are in there. So the threshold here for new, new uh, alfalfa stands is two caterpillars per square foot. And if it's an established stand, it could be four caterpillars per square foot. Uh, tillage, flood irrigation, weed control, and, and in furrow insecticides, those are good prevention tools um, for army cutworm. And then, as I said, they're nocturnal. So if you're gonna apply an insecticide, do it again in the afternoon or in the evening. Not gonna have as much of an impact on your pollinators as well, but the main thing here is that you wanna uh, be applying that insecticide so that you know right away in that after you know when it gets into the nighttime, those caterpillars are gonna be coming out and um, they'll be coming in contact with those insecticides. So that's kind of a, a good timing strategy there. Next is the variegated cutworm. So here's what these ones look like, kind of that gray brown color. They have yellow spots down the back and then they'll have an orange head capsule. You can see with that black W. Same things uh, with these are gonna be showing up June and July and then they're gonna be feeding on the new leaves. These ones can cut plants, but that's um, pretty rare to be honest. Uh, variegated cutworm management here. Um, again, you can do those, uh, those soil samples to be looking for them. Um, you can also use a sweet net to scout for these ones. And the threshold here is either two caterpillars per square foot or two to three uh, per sweep. Again, just like the other cutworm there, weed control and infrared insecticides for prevention and applying uh, insecticides late in the day. And one thing to note with these is you don't want to use an insecticide if the caterpillars are longer than um, an inch and a half, because at that point they're far enough along in development that the damage is already done and um, it's not really worth spraying. That's more of a revenge tactic at that point. Next is dingy cutworm. And this is what they look like here, this kind of light gray or brown color. And you can't see it too well from this picture here, but they have V markings down the back, and then they'll have uh, four black dots on top of each segment there. And you can kind of see at least a couple of the black dots there on each segment on this one. Same thing here, June and July is when they're going to be out and about. Um, then they'll feed on new leaves and they can cut the plants. So um, for these ones, you're going to be looking, you know, for that feeding injury. Um, on the plants, again, you know, they're nocturnal, so you're going to be digging holes and, and sifting through the soil to look for these. Uh, new stands, there you go, the threshold again, two caterpillars per square foot and established stands would be four. And then the same, you know, prevention and um, applying insecticides late in the day. Okay, so for other defoliator caterpillars, um, here's just Two to mention uh, the alfalfa caterpillar. Um, this is that kind of a darker green. They have this bright white stripe down the side and then the green clover worm. And they'll be a little bit um, more of a paler green and like a, a less defined um, white stripe there on them. And then this is what the, the, adult, um, uh, the adults look like if you're interested there. The, the butterflies here, the alfalfa caterpillars, they have if you see those white or yellow butterflies floating around in your field, you probably have alfalfa caterpillars in there. And then the green clover worms are just kind of this drab uh, brown moth. So for management with these, you wanna just consider that along with other defoliator pests that are in the field. Now in general, natural enemies, like I talked about, those predators and parasite or parasitoids are gonna be keeping those populations at bay um, and really management action for just these caterpillars alone is, is often unnecessary. 
So that's gotten through the, the majority of them here. Uh, the last one that I wanna talk about is uh, these blister beetles. And this is an insect that it's, it's been in the news um, last year, actually. It was probably about this, this time last year, I think when news broke about this insect that um, long story short, there was a issue in, in uh, Wisconsin that they had, they had gotten hay from, I think it was a, a, a hay auction in South Dakota and it was, a, it was a horse ranch that got it. And they ended up that these beetles made a lot of their horses sick. It actually killed some of them. Um, and it ended up, I think that the, the hay actually originated from Texas, but it was really a wake up call for a lot of people, um, especially here in South Dakota, um, that these insects are present and that they can kind of cause some problems. So we're gonna talk about, kind of go into quite a bit of detail about these blister beetles here today. So in general, this insect can be up to an inch long. Um, the color is pretty variable. We'll go through some of the different species that we see. Um, they're attracted to blossoms and pollen. That's if any flowering plants, that's where they're gonna immediately try and congregate to. And they're actually predatory insects. So they feed on grasshopper eggs. And you think, well, that's, that's great. And it is, but there is a drawback with these. So as I said, it, they made those horses and stuff sick. Well, that's because they contain this chemical known as cantharidin and it causes blistering. So if you touch these with your bare hands, you get blisters on your skin. So if you're, if you're gonna pick one of these things up, I recommend wearing gloves. Um, but the issue is that that chemical can be released when these beetles are crushed. So when you bale up alfalfa that is infested with these blister beetles, it can contaminate that alfalfa. And then when you go to feed it to livestock, um, it can make them sick. Um, and with horses, it can actually be fatal. Uh, I think, you know, a cow would probably have to eat quite a few of these. It might make them sick, but I don't think it would actually kill the animal. So let's talk about blister beetle toxicity. So um, there is, there's been a, a few studies that have looked at this and tried to quantify um, how toxic that these beetles can be. And it's estimated that for it to be fatal for a horse, um, it'd take about one milligram per 2.2 pounds um, in concentration of this, this cantharidin for it to be fatal. And to put it into perspective, each blister beetle might contain um, somewhere around one to five milligrams um, per adult. So the stripe the, and the ash gray um, here in South Dakota have the highest concentrations. Uh, that stripe has an average of, of about five uh, milligrams and the ash gray is um, an average of one milligram. So this table here just kind of shows, um, you know, maybe a little bit better to visualize what this might look like. So you can see that you have those, some of the species here on the, on the one side, and then you have the estimated number of blister beetles that would require or be required to cause mortality by horse weight. Just ignore the spotted blister beetle. Um, I know that I think those are more kind of a, a, an insect further west and, and south. Um, they, I know they have them in Colorado. I have heard reports, I think in, in like Montana, but um, really not even, I, I've never seen them here. So I'm not really including them in this list, but um, they're on this table because they were part of this um, original study that looked at this. But say you have a 500 pound horse um, and let's look at the, the black blister beetles. They're not as toxic. So it'd take, you know, 1,100 of these for it to kill that 500 pound horse. But the three strike blister beetle that has, you know, that higher concentration um, of cantharidin, it'd only take 80 of these. So it's a pretty big difference there. And it's why it's important to kind of know what species are out in the field. So you know kind of how, how toxic that, that that alfalfa might be. Um, so common species here, the black blister beetle, ash gray, immaculate, striped, and the margin. And I'll show pictures of each one of these here. I'll just kind of go through them briefly. 
The black blister beetle, these are about two fifths to two thirds of an inch long. And they have this whole black body. The ash gray, they're gonna be black or this light gray color. Again, with these two fifths to two thirds of an inch long. The immaculate blister beetle. So these are the larger ones. Um, they can be half to one inch long. And then the whole body will be either this orange or gray color. And then the striped blister beetle. Um, this one is the, the most toxic, I think, that we have here in South Dakota. These are two fifths to two thirds of an inch long. They'll be black and yellow or orange. Um, they'll have these stripes on them. You can kind of see from this picture the two triangular markings there on the head. Um, and then they have those black stripes on the thorax there and the abdomen on the, on the elytra. These are pretty easy to spot. Um, they definitely have those uh, bright colors. They're, they're hard to miss. And then the margin blister beetle, um, here's what they look like, kind of that gray black or black with white margins. And that's what this one here in the picture has. And then they'll have a black and white head. And these ones can actually cause some considerable defoliation. Um, not enough to really worry about, but if you're a gardener, um, they can cause some, some damage in, in gardens. So when to scout for blister beetles? Well, um, the main thing here is you just wanna check the, the fields prior to each cutting. And they're not gonna show up until kind of the later cuttings, usually your first cuttings in the clear. Um, but your later cuttings is when they're going to be um, higher populations of these showing up. And the thing to mention, I, I said that they feed on grasshopper eggs. Um, there's, they'll actually mirror those grasshopper populations in the following year. So places where you had high grasshopper populations, you know, last year, that might be a higher risk area for having blister beetles um, this year. So how to scout for them? Again, using the sweep netting. Um, the sweep netting is a great tool just to, um, to just kind of sift through there and collect insects that you might not normally, you know, see with the naked eye. But um, you know, visual observations too are, are are an option there that you can just look through it. But I highly recommend using a sweep net because you can find those insects a lot easier. So there's no established thresholds for these. It's more of a presence or absence kind of a thing. Um, and you want to make sure you know what species are present in the field. So for management, um, as I said, they're really attracted to those flowering plants. So try and harvest the alfalfa prior to peak bloom. Um, so that way they don't even you know, show up in the field in large numbers to begin with. If they are out there, you'll want to cut the hay um, without using a conditioner. You don't want to crimp it or or crush it because it can smash those beetles. And um, even if they're smashed, that can't there, then we'll just kind of coat the, the alfalfa and that's not a good thing. Um, another thing you want to allow the hay to dry before you rake it up. Um, if, I mean, if it has a high infestation there, those beetles, because then that'll give those, those beetles time to just kind of vacate um, that hay before you rake it and then and bale it up. And the big thing here with blister beetles is you don't want to use insecticides to manage them um, because you're going to kill them. And even if they're, you know, alive or dead, they're still going to have that cantharidin in them. And that's what's going to be um, the, the issue with them. So if you, if you spray it, you kill all the beetles, they're going to just stay in the field. They're not going to, they're not going to vacate at all. So it'll actually increase the number of beetles that you might have per bale. So last thing here, just talking about blister beetle management, um, some consider or other management options here for considering if you um, if you have hay that's infested for um, buying and selling it. Um, if you have hay that's infested, you want to notify the the buyer that you know that that, that hay is infested if they're planning on um, feeding it to horses. And on that note, you want to just really focus on feeding the the first cutting. To horses because that's what's going to be at you know the lower risk of having those beetles present um, if you can. And then the other thing is avoid feeding hay from the field edges because we can have an edge effect um, with these beetles that though they might not be you know out in the middle of the field but certainly on the borders um, you might have higher 
higher populations of these insects. So that's all I have for you today. Um, here's my contact information. Um, you know, feel free to email or uh, send me pictures that way or stop by the office. So I will stop sharing here and turn it back over to you, Sarah. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, so if there are questions for Pat, we're gonna keep rolling, but we have time for maybe one or two questions. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A or the chat. And in the meantime, um, I'll ask Matt to launch the poll for Pat's talk, if you can help us uh, fill it by filling that out. And I will also provide the QR code here. It just takes a second for the screen share to pop up. But again, we've got a minute or so here. If you do have a question, go ahead and throw that in the chat, the Q&A. Okay, Pat. Um, what insects are you watching for this year in alfalfa, given the mild winter in the extreme cold and now potentially drought, or the drought that we are seeing in some places? Um, so I would say, I mean, kind of all of the above, big ones to watch for would probably be um, potato leaf hoppers. They can be a little bit worse um, during, during dry years. Um, grasshoppers, obviously, if we do have drought conditions, they're not going to be hanging around in the, the grassland too long and they're going to be moving into those green areas. Um, those would be probably two of the bigger ones I'd be watching for, um, you know, if it, if it does be a, if, if it ends up being a dry year. Okay. And if there are more questions, um, looks like we have one. I'll just have Pat address further questions uh, typing in to the Q&A. Although, um, why don't we have, Emmanuel, you go ahead and pull up your slides. This is maybe a good question to address the whole audience. How cautious do, do ranchers need to be with blister beetles so they don't have ill effects to themselves? Um, how, how cautious? So they don't have, yeah. Um, I mean, you're saying just like being personally injured or something like I said, I think just, so. just wear gloves. <laughs> That's the, don't, don't try to pick them up with your hands. Um, they kind of, they do the, like this reactive bleeding and it, that kind of how it, how it, uh, puts out that, that cantharidin. So just kind of be careful around them. Don't smash them. <laughs> And if, again, if there's more questions for Pat, you can throw them in the Q&A and we'll type back to you. Um, so we're gonna move on to the diseases portion. Thanks, Pat, that was great. I think you covered a lot of the, the major issues that we get questions on. Um, we're gonna start with uh, Dr. Emmanuel Biomkama. He's our extension plant pathology specialist. And then we're gonna move into um, Connie Strunk, who is our field specialist in plant pathology. And each of them specialize uh, in plant diseases and are going to share with us a little bit more on specific alfalfa diseases that we should be looking for. Go ahead, Emmanuel. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I hope you can see my slides fine and you can hear me okay. Um, so uh, this morning I wanted to highlight uh, a few diseases that affect uh, alfalfa uh, and then Connie will talk a little bit about um, viruses that also affect alfalfa. So because of time, I may rush through these, but hopefully at the end we'll have some time to have uh, continued discussions. So um, one of the main diseases we see in alfalfa is alfalfa rust. Uh, so rust can also be really bad in alfalfa. And like any other rust disease, uh, the best way to know you have rust, just uh, rub your fingers on the leaf and you should see some uh, rusty color remaining in between your, your your fingers and so that will tell you that you have rust if there's any other disease like uh, black stem um, summer uh, leaf spot uh, or or uh, spring black stem uh, and leaf spot uh, those ones will not leave any color between your fingers so that's one way quickly you can tell that you have rust. Um, the other distinction I wanted to make about uh, our alfalfa rust is actually you can have the top just looking fine um, and I will show a picture of that. So it's important to turn the leaf underneath and that's where you see uh, these symptoms uh, because of um, the rust. Um, so this rust can be severe and you can see here on this leaf you know it's turning starting to turn color and obviously it will 
drop over time. And as I mentioned, uh, the field, you can look just fine on top, but you might see a little bit of these patches where you have some yellowing. And this could be mistaken for maybe a nutrient deficiency like nitrogen or um, sulfur. But actually, uh, when you go in and open the canopy, then you might see a leaf drop. And of course, when you turn that leaf under, <clears throat> excuse me, then you see those uh, pastures of the rust. Uh, this disease is going to develop uh, a bit later in the fall. Usually the last cutting is what's affected mostly uh, because the, the pathogen is favored by cool and wet weather. Uh, the pathogen, actually, this rust can survive on, on uh, alfalfa if we have a mild winter. But for the most part, the, past, the, the spores are blown from the south uh, where you know it will survive uh, when the crop in the south where it's warm and then spores are blown northwards. But in years where we have mild winters, then we can have these spores actually surviving on the alfalfa and then continue infecting the crop uh, in, in the next season. Um, we usually don't recommend a fungicide application uh, just because by the time you see this disease, it has already, you know, developed. And whereas the fungicide may stop the disease from progressing, but you know, you're not keeping the crop there for long, you're going to cut it soon. And so the fungicide, whereas may help with the quality, but in, in terms of tonnage, uh, you're not going to see an increase. And so that's why we usually say that the economics of applying a fungicide in, in alfalfa may not pay. So we have to watch that, yeah, except where we have a new crop. Uh, if you have a, a new stand of alfalfa uh, and then you have, you know, the rust coming early, then you may want to save, you know, the, to improve the standability of the, of the new crop, then there a fine side may be recommended. But the best way to manage this alfalfa, alfalfa rust is to make sure you're scouting in and as soon as you see the rust, um, then you can cut early before a leaf drop and that, that way you can save on the quality of the crop. The next disease we'll look at is spring, uh, spring black stem and leaf spot. Uh, this is a fungal disease also. Uh, it starts with these uh, black spots on the leaves. They can also be on the stem. Actually, when they go on the stem and you have the entire stem gathered by these uh, uh, lesions, I uh, just have the entire stem turning black. And of course, all the leaves would have dropped. And uh, that can, of course, cause uh, both quality and quantity uh, losses. Uh, so this is one of the diseases we see. And <clears throat> it's also going to be more severe on uh, a new crop. Uh, so uh, and especially that drops early in the season, you know, it can affect the subsequent cuttings of the of the crop. Uh, so it's just like the name suggests, you know, this, uh, the, the disease is going to be more common in the spring. So when we have cooler and wet conditions, uh, that's when we see this uh, disease develop in, in alfalfa. And as we saw, some of the pictures you know, it can be pretty severe. Uh, so you want to be watching for it. And then again, if uh, the crop is a new crop, then uh, a fine site could be recommended. But otherwise, uh, the best way is to just keep scouting and then cut early of alpha before this disease, you know, explodes and uh, you have more inoculum in the field. Uh, so again, watching the weather and scouting is going to be important pretty much for most of these uh, alfalfa diseases uh, and deciding to cut early to make sh making sure that, you know, the disease is not continuing to develop and leading to quality losses. So related to uh, the spring, black stem and left spot is the summer black stem and left spot. So these are two different diseases and they are caused by different pathogens. The, uh, the spring one is caused by former and then the summer one is caused by Cercospora. So these two different pathogens and they require different uh, weather conditions. But they cause pretty much the same damage, uh, you know, causing that leaf drop, a leaf drop. Uh, you can see here where, you know, these spots are pretty severe. The leaf has turned color and then it can lead to uh, these leaves dropping. 
um, these parts can be, you know, anywhere on, on the patio and of course on the stem. Uh, but luckily for summer black stem and leaf spot, we actually don't see this as, as often as the spring one. Um, and it also, it also happens to be a bit late in the season. So it tends to affect more on the uh, last cutting. However, uh, as, as I already mentioned, um, scouting in early, and especially if this is a new crop and you're finding uh, summer or spring uh, black stem, then you may want perhaps to think of a fine side, but again, keep in mind that because we're not keeping the foliage for long on the crop, because we're gonna cut and harvest, you know, fine side economics don't pay that well in alfalfa. So managing, reducing the, the quality loss is more important and that can be done through timely cutting uh, when we scout early. So here quickly, um, again, these are some of the management tips. Uh, make sure you're scouting and then cutting early and then deciding on a fund side, especially if the crop is uh, just starting. And so lastly, I'll uh, talk about the cron root complex. So cron and root root complex. Uh, this is a disease that can really affect plant stand. Uh, as you can see here, the progression of the disease. Um, I have also a picture to show. Uh, if, you, if you're in doubt, just get that um, stem and, uh, and lower uh, part of the stem and the crown and split it. And you're gonna see this rotting here in, in the top part of the crown area. And it can be pretty extensive. And once it goes around and gathers the, the stem, then uh, the crown area, then you know you, you lose the standards can be seen here in this picture. Uh, so this is a, a, a common problem we see in alfalfa and it's caused by several pathogens uh, in the field. Uh, and because you know it's already, affecting a, a crop that's already established, you know, it's, there, there's, there are very few things we can do, but um, the best we can do is lessen the conditions where this disease may affect our crop. And so some of the things we need to be aware of is that uh, most of the crops that are, most of the plants that are affected by this disease are going to be because of, the, of the, those plants are stressed. And so reducing the stress in alfalfa can help us manage the crown and road uh, complex. Uh, especially looking at um, a fertility level, I'm sure uh, uh, Anthony will be speaking more on the on the fertility management, but also other things that may cause stress, like insect damage. You know, uh, that's an area that Patrick covered pretty well. Uh, looking at uh, maintaining the the frequency of cutting and also reducing the traffic on alfalfa. So especially when after cutting, then they come in to to pick the the alfalfa after more than 48 hours. You know, when uh, regrowth is happening, once those are damaged, then you have the opportunity for pathogens to start infecting uh, the, the regrowth. So uh, reducing the stress on the plants and also looking at some of the varieties that are tolerant to uh, traffic you know, can be helpful. And maybe during the general discussion, we can have uh, an open forum where we can have some ideas. How do you reduce traffic on alfalfa so that you know we're not uh, increasing stress on the plants and opening uh, chances for these pathogens to affect the crown and, and causing rot, rot as well. So um, that's pretty much what I had to go through quickly because of time. I'll have here one more uh, problem that we've seen that's not caused by disease, but actually by potassium deficiency, but some symptoms could look like herbicide injury or could be mistaken for a disease, but where you see these kind of spots on the on the leaves and also in clusters, uh, not just the entire field, which would be a case of uh, a chemical injury, that would tell you that you have um, uh, potassium deficiency. So we can have probably more discussions um, during the open forum, but for now, I'll end it here and have maybe a few minutes for Kanye to talk on viruses in alfalfa. Sorry, my computer's just been a little laggy. There we go. All right, I'm just gonna very briefly talk about the most common virus in alfalfa, that is alfalfa mosaic virus. And why this is an issue or a concern is this virus can infect soybeans. So it's something to be mindful of. How does alfalfa mosaic virus transmit? Well, it's transmitted by many different aphid species 
most commonly the P aphid, the blue alpha alpha aphid, and the spotted alpha 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 aphid that Patrick talks about. But most abundantly here in South Dakota that we see the transmission occur from are those P aphids with alpha alpha mosaic virus. You know, some of the symptoms or what it looks like is alpha alpha mosaic virus overwinters in those alpha alpha crowns. And then when you get the new growth or the young tissue, youngest tissue, you're gonna to start to see some of that yellow and green mosaic pattern develop on those leaves. The symptoms really differ with age of the plant and like weather conditions. So, you know, we kind of heard how Patrick talked about those cool and wet conditions, you know, that make it a little bit more ideal for some of those aphids to move around and makes the transmissions. So what we'll see is if you see symptoms develop really early in the season, especially during like a cool wet spring, most of the time, if they happen really early, those infections transmitted or took place from the fall. So from infections that happened in the fall. So like weather and symptoms of, with age really to make a, make determine when that infection took place. The infected plants with AMV have reduced vigor over time that that can lead to some stand decline. So how do we manage for alfalfa mosaic virus? Well, the real quick rule of thumb is there's no rescue treatments for viruses. So once those alfalfa plants has those AMV symptoms, you're, you're not able to fix that plant or make it go away. Things that you can do is if you're looking to seed a new stand of alfalfa, select the alfalfa cultivars that have some resistance to alfalfa mosaic virus. Um, no matter if you're going new planting or existing, control those broadleaf weeds, especially black nightshade, as that's found to be a host for alfalfa mosaic virus. And then especially if you have you know, soybeans in the area, since AMV can go to soybeans, you wanna control that. And then really the biggest thing that you can do is scout closely for those aphid populations and manage them early to prevent additional spread of AMV within the field. So that is a quick look at the most common virus here in alfalfa. With that, I'm going to stop the share and turn it back to Sarah. All right, thanks Connie and Emmanuel. Um, we're going to have a quick poll here on the combination of both talks as the disease topic. So if you could just fill that out for us on the disease topic, we would appreciate it. And while that's rolling, if anyone has a question, Anthony, you can go ahead and pull up your slides. Anthony Bly is our soils field specialist um, and he works out of the Sioux Falls Regional Center. And today he's gonna talk about soil fertility and forages. Um, I'm assuming probably mainly alfalfa, but we'll let him explain further what he's going to uh, be talking about today. And he's gonna finish, finish off the day with some forage info. Um, and at the very end, we will have another QR code for those of you looking for credits. There'll be another half credit um, and a little bit of extra info at the end followed by our informal discussion. So um, Anthony, I will let you go ahead and begin. Uh, do you see the presenter slides yep, looks there? Good. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm just gonna give a little overview on forage soil fertility. I am gonna cover a little bit more than uh, alfalfa. I have uh, 15 slides, so uh, here we go. Uh, first slide is our um, current uh, nutrient recommendations for alfalfa out of the uh, fertilizer recommendation guide. I've kind of clipped out the little title heading there as you see on our website and included the, uh, the web link, uh, but it's based on yield goal. And so knowing your yield goal is very important and uh, determining uh, your phosphorus and potassium uh, nutrient requirements. And so it's based on a category, very low to very high in each one of those, phosphorus and, um, and potassium. I'll see if I can do the screen pointer here. Um, yeah, there you go. So here's the categories right here. And uh, you can see as the uh, soil test uh, actually goes down in this direction, our, our recommendation goes up, and then as yield go, goes up, so does the recommendation as well. And that's both the same for phosphorus and potassium, same approach, just different numbers. Of course, there's no recommendation for nitrogen on alfalfa. 
Uh, moving on to grass, um, this would be both cool season and warm season grasses. Uh, again, based on yield goal here, one to seven tons. And then this would be the nitrogen requirement for those yield goals. And then here's the, uh, the heading on the, the document that's online and then the link right here. And we can provide that again if you need it. But again, the phosphorus and potassium recommendations are both uh, uh, according to uh, category. So these would be our higher testing uh, phosphorus soils and this would be our very low. And uh, those are, th that interpretation is also included in this, in this guide. But at very low, our recommendation for grass is 40, 40 pounds per acre and very low for potassium would be about 69. So you can see that the recommendation goes away here at the higher soil test levels. And then we also have a recommendation table for forage sorghum and sedan grass. Uh, again, uh, a, a yield goal based system. And uh, you know, I'd really encourage you to try to get some handle on yield goal. Um, you know, count bales, uh, if you could weigh a couple bales, estimate the yield that way. Uh, it just helps, um, you know, manage, manage your fields. Uh, when you do take a soil sample, then you know if you're at five tons and you're medium, this is roughly what you should put on here, 22 pounds. And you would need 125 pounds of nitrogen for that five ton yield goal and a 64 pounds of of potassium here for that medium category. Okay, so that's this is a way we can use soil testing uh, to manage the nutrient requirements of our forages coupled along with, with that yield goal. So, you know, I could stop there and be done uh, with SDSU recommendations, but, you know, I've always wanted to dig through the literature. And uh, so there's the pile of, um, of uh, what we call progress reports. Uh, that have been published. Uh, those were created through 2010 and then somewhere along the road there, we kind of lost, lost that. But uh, that's the pile that goes back actually to 1949. Uh, this book here has some reports in it from 1949 and then up to 2010 up here. So what I did is I dug through all those and I found a significant amount of forage fertility work from 1975 to 2010. What, I, what I've got for you is a warm season summary, a cool season summary, now these are grasses, and then a forage sorghum summary, and then alfalfa, alfalfa at the end. You can see the years here uh, where that data comes from. So some of it's kind of old, but uh, you know what? I think it's still pretty good. So this is what I found out for alfalfa response to phosphorus in South Dakota from those, from those studies. We had 11, site years of data. Actually, I did it by cutting, so the 33 cuts. Uh, each one of those cuts had four replications. So we're comparing phosphorus application to no phosphorus application here on a relative scale. Uh, that's because those yields are all over the board. And so to get them on one graph and make some sense out of them, that's what we have to do. We take the treated plot divided by the check plot. So a plot that got phosphorus compared to the plot that didn't times 100 is a percent. So here's what we got in our lower soil test categories here, the low and the medium, we're seeing some really good responses here to phosphorus application. And that's what we wanna see. Uh, and then as we get higher, actually we don't have, we have some right here on the border between medium and high, but then as we go into the very high, that response is going down. And I just put that line in there, uh, just drew that line, that's not a mathematical function, but to kind of just promote the idea, uh, soil testing important, know your phosphorus level, and definitely if you're down in these categories here, you, you, you need to get some phosphorus on. I think Emmanuel mentioned that as well, uh, as far as importance for reducing disease. Here's the potassium uh, results that I found. Um, Kind of presented this in a little bit different way. Didn't have enough data to really put on a graph like that I had with phosphorus. Uh, so what I did is this is the rate of the uh, treated plot here across the bottom. And uh, you can see we had all these at 100 here. This is a very high soil test category for potassium. 
So those would be over 160. And then this would be high, about 140 to 160. What you can see here is the range and yields that we got from the alfalfa. And this is, this is by cutting. And so you can see those little bit of differences here. We actually have a little bit of negative response here. Small positives, another negative, another negative. So not a lot of a uh, story to tell here. Uh, again, we're in the high category. So we really wouldn't get too excited about applying potassium to alfalfa until we get below, below this category. Although this is kind of the time uh, when your soil tests come back in this category to be kind of anxious. Definitely not in the very high. Here's our cool season grass response to phosphorus application. I did the same thing, uh, except we have very low category here and low. And uh, the, again, these were the rates of phosphorus that were applied and then the individual responses at each one of those sites. So some nice, nice responses here, especially uh, these two here, maybe this one and this one. So when you're very low phosphorus test, applying some phosphorus is good. And then when we even get up here to low, uh, there's not as many responses, but uh, there are a few right here in this, in this site here. So uh, again, soil test guiding light. Our cool season nitrogen response uh, had a number of sites. I was able to plot this out. And what we do is we again convert it to a relative yield. Each individual plot divided by the highest yield in the plot. And, uh, and it shows our response here, um, oh, uh, plotted over soil test nitrate and zero to 24 inch, plus the fertilizer in that was applied. So somewhere here at about 140, 130 pounds is kind of a critical value. So we would say you would take that 130 minus your soil test nitrate at, in the two foot, and then that would be what we'd recommend. Of course, I'd recommend that you follow the, the chart that I showed you, but this is some of the data that was included in how that chart was derived. Here's the warm season response to nitrogen. I divided the data into two groups, a high yielding group and a lower yielding group. Of course, we know that's uh, controlled by our climate. Uh, we can see here that the high yielding group, we found kind of a critical level here at 150 but the low yielding group just kind of kept going up and up. And, and a true soil fertility researcher would probably draw the critical level here. Well, we know that, you know, you don't want to put on 290 pounds of N uh, for your native grasses or your warm grasses. So, so this data is kind of in, inconclusive. Uh, I really think uh, the, it's pointing at this 150 line. Then we also had protein data uh, associated with that warm season grass, and it, I'm showing it to you because it's really uh, uh, what we what we expect to see. So in the low yield environment, uh, where we could increase yield from from additional applications of nitrogen, we see a nice increase here in protein in that forage. But in the in the high yielding environment where we, we really built the house, we built the structure, we built the plant, we could punch up that protein with any further nitrogen application. So there's a relationship between high and low yield environments as far as protein. So cover crops, I wanna spend a little time on this. Sarah challenged me. Uh, she thought, she said she'd be interested in wanting to hear what I have to say about this. Well, it really totally depends on the situation. One of the main goals of the cover crop is to use excess nutrients. And, and so it, the cover crop is a tool to use what's left over. But if we think about the different uses of cover crops, maybe we can uh, establish some relationships here. So this could be a place to start. For cover crops following short season cash crops like wheat or oats or other cereal grains, if the cash crop yield goal is not reached, I don't think there's any need to fertilize the cover crop. I think there's extra nutrients there and it can do what, what cover crops were designed to do or what the intended purpose. But if we exceeded our yield goal, say we fertilized for 60 bushel wheat and got 90, uh, we're gonna be a little limited on our nutrients in the soil there. And so that cover crop is gonna look kind of peaked and gonna suffer. So maybe a good place to start would be with about 30 pounds of nitrogen or five pounds of sulfur. I would do this experimentally, uh, maybe 
put that rate on a few strips and then uh, just double up a, a strip and just compare for yourself. I think it's really important, especially if you're going to graze, graze those cover crops that you want to increase productivity to get the value back. So we, we don't know the real answer, but I think some experimentation based on these, these two sets of uh, examples would be good. Of course, there's the full season cover crops that totally depends on yield goal. Uh, as I showed you uh, previously in the, in the tables from our fertilizer recommendation guide, of course, in the mixed species cover crops, we have grasses and broadleaves and maybe legumes. If we fertilize those legumes, they're gonna tend not to want to nodulate and, and we want them to. So there's a corundum there. What, what, you know, what shall we do? Uh, but again, those grasses need a significant amount of nitrogen to produce a good forage yield uh, like you want to do with a full season cover crop. So I think I would experiment with lower rates of N and sulfur, about 30 to 70 pounds of N and 10 to 20 pounds of sulfur, and then use the P and K soil test for your guide. If you're, if you're in that low and very low category, definitely you, you would need to apply some phosphorus and some potassium. Uh, with the fall seeded cover crops, I, I just don't think there's a need, need for any fertilizer on the fall season cover crops. There just isn't enough time to really get a big value for grazing. And really it's just the living root, uh, it's the cover, uh, that, that's the purpose of that, and then to start growing in the spring. So in summary, I think yield, uh, realistic yield goals are very important. Uh, count those bales, maybe try to weigh a few, estimate that way. Our, uh, our fertilizer recommendation guides at this site. If the recommend, recommendation is zero based on soil sampling, then it's zero, we'll leave it. Okay, that's really important in, in tight economic margins and maybe drought situations where, where if it's zero, then believe it. If the yield goal is, is difficult to estimate, you know, you, you, just, you just can't get that done. It sure looks like 150 pounds in is a critical level for our grasses. So what we need to do is, is we need to uh, uh, subtract soil test end to two feet from 150 and that should result in a good fertilizer nitrogen recommendation. Then cover crop nutrient recommendations are not based on science. It's just my conjecture, experience, and, and what I've seen, and, and kind of some common sense. So we don't have any of that data available, so put out some check strips and, and, and see what happens. So with that, I'm done. Um, I think I fit into my time slot pretty well, showing our uh, civil rights uh, screens there. And then this is my contact information um, as well. Thanks, Anthony. That was that was a lot of information on everyone's part in a short period of time. So is that really fast? Appreciate it. No, no, <laughs> I mean, everybody did well. Uh, just a lot of topics to fit into one week. Yes. Um, if, if there's questions for Anthony, that was a lot of info. Um, please feel free to type them in the Q&A or the chat. And just because we're up against the, the top of the hour here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share with you a couple things so that people who, who need to go can. You'll see the poll popping up. There it is. Uh, please fill out that poll. That is for Anthony's talk specifically. So if you can keep that in mind, that just gives us an idea for our presenters on what they can, what you liked and, and what could be changed as well. So we appreciate you taking a minute to fill that out. Um, if you check the chat, you'll see a link to our recordings. Those are posted as, as soon as they're able to get them captioned and ready to go. Um, so you can click on that. That'll take you to our YouTube channel and all of the previous crop hours should be there or they will be soon. And I also posted a link to our printed pest guides and publications. If you'd like a printed publication because of COVID, most everything's virtual, but you can request at the link in the chat and we will make sure to get you some publications. Um, tomorrow, you should be getting an email also, that will be a survey for the entire forages topic. So we'd really appreciate it if you'd be willing to fill that out. And I'm just looking here. Do we have any questions? Not yet. I know there were a couple, uh, as Anthony was talking, that Emmanuel and Connie addressed. But if there are any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat. In just a minute here, Matt will start moving us all over to um, be panelists so you can, we can have more of an informal discussion. You can talk with the speakers. Um, you can turn on your camera and use your mic if you prefer or, or continue to type. Um, but we thank everyone for joining today. 
I don't see any more formal questions, um, but stay on the line here if you do have questions and we will address them as he moves everyone over. Um, we still have one more day of the forage week. Tomorrow, uh, I'll be talking about round bale storage and Jack Davis will be discussing haystacks in a market outlook. So tune in at 10 tomorrow if you're interested in either of those topics, uh, we'll be glad to have you. So I'll give, give it just a minute here to get everyone switched over and welcome questions.